Fame is a tricky thing. Although for some, it can lead to a glamorous life, it also carries with it the terrible risk that you'll come face to face with the dark side of humanity. Today, Peaches Christ joins us to take a look at the spooky stories of Hollywood actors who were murdered in real life, and her amazing three week run as Crystal Connors in Showgirls the Musical. Listen as we talk with Peaches Christ about the demands of singing the musical number, You're a Whore, Darlin'. Sexy actor Sal Minio in a Speedo. Silent film star Ramon Novarro, who was rumored to have been killed by an Art Deco-led dildo. And why the murder of the little rascals Alfalfa may have been a Hollywood cover-up. I'm Fausto Fernos. I'm Mark Fillion. And this is Feast of Fun. There's a sale happening now through Labor Day. We're offering 20% off of everything at our store, feastoffun.com slash store. Just use the coupon code FUN at checkout to get 20% off of everything. We have brand new t-shirts, mugs, and tote bags filled with fun. Plus, we're introducing a whole new line of high-quality leather goods. Wallets, iPhone cases, backpacks, shaving kits, and more, all handcrafted in Los Angeles. Order today before the sale ends on Labor Day. Use promo code FUN at checkout to get 20% off of everything. Hello. (laughs) Hello. Is this Peaches Christ? Yes, it is. It's me, Fausto Fernos. And Mark Fillion from Feast of Fun. How are you doing, darling? From which podcast? The Feast of Fun, the world's greatest LGBTQ podcast. Oh, <laughs> fierce. <laughs> Girl, how are you doing? Are you, have you recovered from your two-week run of uh, Showgirls the Musical? No, and it was a three-week run. Three-week? Oh, my God. Did it get extended? It did, yes. That's amazing. I bet you're just dead tired. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, I am. <laughs> I, I imagine you laying in a hospital bed like Crystal Connor thinking about a nice settlement. Yes, that's exactly, I mean, that is exactly how I feel. I feel like I've been off at Showgirls Boot Camp for the last two months. Oh, yeah, because you actually had to rehearse for this one. Oh, yeah, this was like a uh, a massive, uh, oh, he's not lying. I mean, this was probably quadruple the rehearsals we're used to. Well, because usually you do a show and you can, you, you write it, you do it, you rehearse it for three or four days. Really. I mean, some, I'm sure you do a little bit longer depending on who you're working with. But, um, it, uh, this one, it seemed like it was, cause this is unlike most of the other musicals, you, uh, the, most other tributes to showgirls you've done. Like this was a full on musical that had played right. actually and, other places and you brought it to SF. Right. Exactly. It was a, a full two hour show 22 songs you know with a with a live band and you know oh. live singing and yeah you know it was massive for us it was a humongous un- undertaking so which character did you play henrietta bazooms <laughs> <laughs> i don't have a fat suit darling no i played crystal connors oh wow how out of character for you <laughs> well you know well, it's it's it was uh well, yeah it's not the most challenging character being a veteran showgirl looking over my shoulder at these young bitches coming up behind me <laughs> you can see the hunger in their eyes <laughs> is that a line from your show <laughs> no it's not but oh. i can see underneath them stupid contact lenses they're all hungry <laughs> What is up with all the modern drag queens wearing like blue contact lenses? I don't know. It freaks me out to this day. I'm still not used to it. Like once in a while, Lady Bear will put them on or, you know, I work with Sharon who wears them a lot. And I'm like, a Bianca, you know, and I'm like, once they put in those contact lenses, I'm like, wow, you're like a it's like like talking to Chucky or something. (laughs) (laughs) They become monsters. Yeah, they're revealed to be the monsters they are within. Well, it's just so I mean, you know, I I think your eyes communicate so much, even when they're surrounded by tons of drag makeup. Mm -hmm. But when you literally cover up that one, you know, window to your soul, um, you know, I think I I think it actually looks fabulous. But even I'm, um, you know, uh, 
what's the word? It throws me a little bit, you know? Mm. Well, to me, like all this facial contouring and contact lenses wanders into some um, dangerous territory of, I don't, I hate how I look and I want to be desperately be somebody else as opposed to, I want to enhance who I am and become this alter ego. That's a reflection of my identity. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I actually co- totally relate to it because like, you know, the peaches Christ, uh, clown makeup, um, that we created so long ago was in a sense to to completely mask what I look like, um, as a boy, uh, I wanted to be it to be a completely different thing. So I actually completely relate to like, uh, Trixie Mattel or anyone who's, you know, doing it over the top. The one thing that I would say, um, I think is, uh, happening now is that YouTube tutorials and television have made it so that, um, there is a certain look that is popular that seems to be, um, I don't know, replicated a lot. Mm -hmm. Painted by the internet. Yeah. Kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. where, where you can really look at like a a queen and go, Oh, you, you know, you you didn't necessarily struggle to uh, figure it out on your own, Um, but I don't blame them. I mean, you know, do you feel any pressure to change your appearance in order to please the internet generation? Mm, not really. I think it's more like I would want to do it for my own um, curiosity and interest. And also I admire it and love it. Like, um, you know, I would love to uh, play with it, but when I have uh, the few times that I have over the years, um, People don't like it, uh, you know. Like peaches, <laughs> pe- peaches fans pretty. are like it, kind of. You know, like I actually, you know, um, feel like I could look prettier, uh, but when I've done it, um, yeah, like people are like, "That's not peaches." Well, and I like, guess, in a sense, I should just be flattered that you know there, there's this sort of thing that people want, you know, there's a very, mm-hmm. so I actually wonder, maybe I should go incognito or and like create another character or something. This is, this is now an idea. Hmm. I could get like mm-hmm. Sharon or someone to paint my face and I could go out and maybe, maybe I'll audition for drag race that way. Ooh, it's something as apples. <laughs> yes. As apples, as apples, Muhammad. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we know a drag queen in common, uh, um, in Austin, Texas, who has two drag characters Mm -hmm. in order to sort of fulfill the niche, to fill the niche. Two roles, right? Yeah. Oh, really? Rebecca Havemeyer and Christine. Yeah. Both oh like yes, Paul Swallow. I know her too. Yeah, I mean the other the weird thing is is like uh, Rebecca Havemeyer's personality isn't that much different than Christine's <laughs> or the sense of humor in some ways. You um, can just understand what Christine, yeah. what what Rebecca is trying to say. Well, I'm sorry, you can understand Rebecca, whereas Christine half the time doesn't make any sense. Right, right, right. But but Christine is going to be way more like kind of trashy and mm-hmm. and sort of disgusting and well, so is Rebecca, but she looks better. So it's more acceptable. <laughs> Rebecca reminds me of like your naughty old grandma or something. Mm. Your me Yeah. Now uh, with showgirls, the musical, you, you were playing crystal Connors. You rehearsed quite some time. You've been doing this for three weeks. You're in a hospital bed now. Have you learned your lesson? Finally, after doing this show for, I mean, this is a musical version, but you've been doing showgirls, in one form or another since pretty much the movie came out. Well, this is, yeah, this is our uh, 19th annual summer celebration. It's the first year we haven't screened the movie. We, we uh, decided to uh, do this musical um, instead to kind of mix things up before our big 20th anniversary, which is next summer. Uh, And um, yeah, I, I, I knew that it was going to be, um, special, but I honestly didn't know that it was going to be, uh, this satisfying, like this, this musical and doing this, what it really challenged us as a production company. And, um, I'm really thrilled with how it all went. I mean, I definitely feel exhausted and it was bigger than anything we've done in a long, long time, but it went really, really well. Well, what are your plans for the 20th? Are you finally getting Elizabeth Berkeley to show up? 
Well, we hope so. I mean, that's that would be the ultimate dream, right? So mm-hmm. um, unfortunately, <laughs> that's out of my control. If it were up to me, I would say yes, of course. But we are certainly um, – Trying. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you raised enough money and got Gina Gershon, who plays Crystal in Showgirls, and Elizabeth Berkley, who plays Nomi in the movie, uh, to show up for your show, would you force them to make out with each other? <laughs> no, I don't I, I don't think it's um I don't think it's about the money per se, you know. I think it it's deeper than that. Like mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think Elizabeth is gonna have to want to do it. Um and uh, See, when yeah, she shows try- up, finally you convince her after all this time to show up. And then at the end you say, see, you were a whore, darling. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. I'm sure that would go over really well. I'm sure she'd She's love like, it. no, on stage. She's like, Peaches Christ, I'm never working with you again. You betrayed me for the last time. <laughs> yeah, I I mean, I that's that's exactly what I don't want her to think, you know, because the reality the reality of it is. Uh, I think, and we've talked about this before, yeah. I think for for many years, especially closer to when the film came out, I think it was a painful experience for mm-hmm. her, understandably. And so what I would love is to show her um, the love and admiration and gratitude that real fans of hers have. Um, mm-hmm. And so I'd really just want her to come, you know, John Waters describes it as um, – like a peaches show. I think he kind of pitched it to Ricky Lake this way. When, when, when I was reaching out to see if Ricky would want to come, you know, um, Ricky checked in with John about me, of course. And John said, Oh, you'll love it. You know, it's a massive crowd, you know, thousand people show up for her events and it's an evening of gay worship. (laughs) And I thought, (laughs) yeah, I guess that's what it is in a sense. What are you trying to get Ricky to come out for? Uh, Ricky came for no. um, c- our Serial Mom anniversary event, Aww. and uh, she was awesome. I love her. She's such a sweet and incredible woman. Uh, but yes, she you know um, checked in with John before agreeing, and I love finding out that that's how he described it to her. Because I think, in some ways, especially for Elizabeth, uh, yeah, would everybody in the audience be gay? Of course not. But there is this sort of um, way that queer people celebrate their um, idols or their icons that's so earnest that I just love for her to experience that wave of love and that standing ovation. Mm. Um, And it's not, you know, I think for real true showgirls fans, it's not um, necessarily, uh, uh, you know, a, this movie's so bad that we, we enjoy making fun of it. I don't really feel that way at all. When we were doing this musical, Every single moment that was, you know, celebrated from the movie, which is like a lot, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you felt the love of the audience. Like these are people who've watched the movie over and over and over again. Um, but as, because I, they I think as gay it. men, we, we really adore outrageous women, outrageous films. And I think the general, the larger culture confuses outrageousness with bad. And I think for her, yeah. like learning that lesson that it sometimes it's it's uh, great to be outrageous, truly, truly outrageous and and uh, let your freak flag fly and be loved and celebrated for uh, all the complexities of being a human being. Yes, exactly. For sure. And and so um, and I think Elizabeth must know that. I mean, you know, she walks around in the world. I mean, imagine how many people come up to her and, you know, t- talk to her about um, showgirls. And I bet she can tell the difference, you know, between someone who's just wide eyed and in awe of what she uh, created versus someone who's, you know, poking fun at her or whatever. Um, I, I can't ultimately, imagine somebody uh, somewhere has yelled at her sooner or later. You're going to have to sell it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. And I'm sure. Yard sale when she was having it. <laughs> I mean, for anyone that, that, yeah, like I, I'm sure, you know, um, there, there, I'm, sh- it, it was, I'm sure it wasn't easy and you know, the, the unfortunate side to that is, you know, she was actually doing and creating, um, a movie that she was being asked to create. She was actually being a really great actress. I mean, if anyone has a problem with 
um, the film, you know, in fairness, they should probably start with the writer and director. Mm. Um, but you know, of course, when, when it was time to trash the movie, uh, the person who was thrown under the bus was Elizabeth. Yeah. Unfairly. So women make easy victims. You know, for sure. You know, so it's and, easy and to I've said them. this like before, and I think it's worth pointing out, like men in Hollywood, especially male actors, they get to be campy and over the top and are celebrated for their outrageous performances, insane, ridiculous performances like Al Pacino, any Al Pacino performance, but especially, I mean, Scarface yeah. uh, or something like that. You know, any Jack Nicholson performance, you know, really – um, Hannibal Lecter, you know, mm. uh, Anthony Hopkins, you know, they get, uh, they win Academy Awards for that style of camp acting, that exaggerated, insane, pushed um, performance. And Faye Dunaway and Elizabeth Berkeley and women who, who dare to be extreme get, you know, um, crucified for it. And I do think that, you know, you can really look at movies and, and see how, um, you know, maybe Meryl Streep, maybe Meryl Streep is one of the few, mm. um, you know, few women who've been able to cross over that way. But really, men have been applauded for it for years in Hollywood. But women are demonized. Have you seen um, Florence Foster Jenkins yet? I did. Yeah. yeah. Do you, did you relate to it? <laughs> um, you're a bitch. <laughs> I relate. That was actually really shady. <laughs> I'll have you know. I'll yeah. have you know, bitch, that I took uh, singing lessons for Showgirls the Musical, <laughs> and many of the Bay Area theater critics applauded my performance. Mm. They my said you could solo. really sing. You know, maybe well, maybe when I'll you die, you like, uh, you know, in the future, we'll find out that your mom was, like, secretly paying off all the <laughs> theater critics in the uh, area. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, or it was I'll Martini. You, it was hot going around. It was him. Martini <laughs> paying, for, paying them all off. He was the mastermind. <sighs> I had to learn to sing in a corset, um, mm. which actually is a special is a different thing as far as breathing goes and where oh, you, yeah. you, you pull it all from. And, and so I, I will say that my, my vocal lessons were incredibly helpful because mm. when, when the coach realized like, Oh, you're going to be doing this in full drag. Like that's a totally different thing. So we actually put the corset on me and figured out where, you know, I could pull mm. my breath from and everything. And it, I'm really like, am I a perfect singer or even a great singer? No, not at all. But did I hold my own in the show? I think so. And I'm really like happy with, you know, how it, cause I like challenging myself mm. after all these years. It's like, okay, let's do this and see how it goes. Yeah. Challenge yourself and challenge the audience. Now, when you wear a corset though, it's like, cause when you listen to like Mae West sing or when she, when you when hear her talk, it's just like, you can see that she's kind of straining because her, she can't really breathe into her, you know, cause oh, that, that corset. I need so yeah, an oxygen really mask. I'm about to pass out. <laughs> mm, mm. Well, I mean, I, I, uh, hope that it didn't look like that as far as, I mean, uh, it, it, you know, the, my number goes, I have one big number in the show. I sing throughout the whole show. Mm. Um, but I have one big solo number called you're a whore, darling. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I hope that, you know, it didn't look like I was struggling too much. Mm. Can but, you oh, sing this show is outrageous. Like a, a I have never can, uh-huh. touched this m- much of a woman's body before this whole show. I am like, <laughs> I'm feeling up Nomi's tits and in drink you're a whore, darling. I have to finger her vagina. And it was, you know, I did, you know, we had to rehearse this and April who plays Nomi kept saying like, um, you know, peaches, you, you need to actually touch my breasts. Like that's what happens. Mm. Um, you know, so it, it, you could hear an audible gasp the first time I reached out and grabbed her bare breasts and fondled them, you know? Now, the person that plays Nomi, she wrote a, a blog entry, I, I believe it was a couple of years ago, and you recently shared it because you're working with her, and she was a, a victim of sexual assault. And mm-hmm. she, and she uh, auditioned for this role and got this role, and she it, she credits it like playing this outrageous character of Nomi Malone as uh, part of her healing process. Yeah, she. I mean, it, it was for Jane Magazine, if anyone's interested. It's a really... Uh, 
powerful piece. And what's interesting about the musical too, is the musical is obviously insane and it's written in such a way that it's celebrating the cultness of the film, but it's much clearer that the celebration is about Nomi's journey. And by the end of the musical, she sings a song called Horrier and it's about <laughs> her needing, needing to become, to combine her mm. experience as a whore mm. with being a warrior and when she goes in to sing Horrier at the end, mm -hmm. the audience is so rooting for Nomi and the strength of that character. And I think April, I mean, April's the kind of performer where you just kind of have to see it to believe it, really. Mm. Well, I wish I, I mean, had her, seen it for sure. Peaches, have, yeah, you, been, have you, you been hanging out in South Carolina? No, I have not. Did you hear the, the story? That there's a, there's a, somebody dressed up as a clown. And uh, they're hanging out in the in the woods, and they're trying to drag kids into the woods, <laughs> uh, dressed up as a clown. And so officials are warning residents in the area that they're to be uh, weary of clowns or people dressed up as clowns, for they might be agents trying to do uh, harm to children. Mm, really? Yeah, I was like, this this sounds this is like a news story that was written for our show. <laughs> It's like it. that's kind of incredible. Yeah. Well, Faust is going through the list of like all the drag queens that look like clowns, and your name came up. <laughs> so the officials right. might be knocking yeah. on your door, or asking you, "It's like where were you?" And then Faust just says, "Well, maybe it's Lady Bunny." And I said, "Well, unless those kids have ten-inch uncut cocks, <laughs> she's not lured <laughs> right. into the woods." <sighs> so a couple well, you know, Bianca's been on hiatus. Mm. Oh well. shit. <laughs> I'm really excited. She's going to, uh, her movie's coming to the LGBT film festival here in Chicago, Hurricane Bianca. I'm hoping I can get tickets for opening night because uh, it really looks fantastic. I'm hoping we could get her on the show. Do you think you might be able to help us with that? <laughs> I mean, sure. Yeah. You, you guys know how to reach out to Bianca. I do, but she don't return my calls now that she's a Hollywood movie star. Well, the bigger, the bigger issue is that, you know, it's a, she's on vocal rest right now. She got surgery. Oh, yeah. She got a cock removed from her throat. Is that what it Nodes. was? I don't know. <laughs> Nodes? Nodes, really? I understand, I understand that Shit. that actually is a, it's an easier operation now than it used to be, right? Things I don't like know. I, 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 I <laughs> hope so. I mean, she posted something, so I don't feel like I'm, I'm revealing, you know. Yeah, she did. She said she was going on rest. You know what also, yeah. too, is like I didn't realize, and I just found out in the past year, too, is that they also have uh, vocal feminization surgery for, for trans women. So maybe Bianca can get both. And be like, maybe so like high pitch voice. She'd be like, <laughs> one, one of the great, mm -hmm. you know, uh, parts of Bianca's comedy is her voice. Yeah. I know for our um, Baby Jane show, it's like you want it to be that sort of brash, a uh, jarring voice coming out of, um, you know, that pretty face. <laughs> 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 so a couple months ago we had a, we had you on the podcast because we, we were going to talk about actresses uh, who had been murdered and I had such a we had such a fun time talking about all these women that uh, you know tragically died at the hands of somebody else and it was uh, I've always been fascinated with murder you've been fascinated with murder and horror and so I, I thought well geez we did the women why not move on to the men and, and discuss some of the actors in Hollywood who have been murdered fair and, is fair fair is fair you know, at first I was looking around and it was like the first one that always came to my mind was uh, Alfalfa from Little Rascals. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, as little kids, you know, we'd watch Little Rascals on television. But at one point in time, you know, kids watch that in the movie theaters. And he went on to do a couple of little acting gigs as an adult. But he mostly had a string of like um, jobs where he'd take people hunting or he'd bartend and he'd do odd jobs around the house. You know, all the Little Rascals, a lot of them really had tragic lives, but he, uh, he was the only one that was murdered. Yeah. Well, you know, Specky McFarland did pretty good and he was mm -hmm. like friends with Michael Jackson in his later years and ran a successful golfing mm -hmm. tournament, the Spanky McFarland classic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. And he even dressed up as Spanky Mark Farland mm -hmm. for uh, publicity photos. There's a, there's a photo of Michael Jackson and, and, uh, uh, Spanky McFarland, uh, well, the guy who played Spanky Mark, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but I researched about the death of Carl Switzer, the, the, the man who played Alfalfa as a kid in 1935 shorts, uh, our gang that later became the popular TV series, The Little Rascals. And over the years for MGM, they've made 
a lot of money. Um, I think was it the Rocky Horror Picture Show and the Little Rascals are some of the top earning properties for the for the film studios that mm. own them. It makes sense to me. I mean, Little Rascals. We watch. I mean, we watched that when I was a kid in the you know in the late seventies, early eighties. I mean, mm. when was when was the Little Rascals filmed? I mean, it was, it was in nineteen thirty five. It was it was uh, created and 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 since then. It has somewhere in the world been airing and showing, just like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm-hmm. And and the thing about it is the the Our Gangs, it was shot and created during the Depression era. Um, it was the first time you had racially integrating actors uh, sharing a screen time together. And um, it, it, it was a it was a pioneering uh, show series uh, for many reasons. But one tragedy of it is that the film studios kept pretty much all the money. The little kids were... Um, seen at that time the same way that you would hire somebody to paint your house. Mm-hmm. Um, you wouldn't give them royalty payments for your home, you know, and they were just seen as stagehands, basically. And um, and so these kids lived out lives uh, where the fame that they had gotten as kids sort of uh, hindered them. And I think one of the uh, child actors actually uh, successfully organized Hollywood and unionized them in order to prevent that from happening to adult actors like the Three Stooges mm-hmm. or to child actors mm-hmm. like the kids that were involved yeah. in it. I think well, it was think Mickey, it was... Uh, the, the little kid that played Mickey in The Little I'm not Rascals. sure. I know like Buster Keaton did a lot for that kind of stuff because he mm-hmm. got paid for movies. And then they're like, well, you keep showing these movies. I should continue to get paid. And what about all these kids? So Carl right. Switzer, uh, as an adult, allegedly was involved with drugs and gang activity. You were telling me he was a meth seller. He sold. He meth. may have been may uh, may or may not have been a meth dealer. So as an adult, uh, he struggled to get at acting roles. And in the last film that he did, in the movie The Defiant Ones, he actually looks like a strung out junkie. So this <clears throat> has led people to believe that the the reasons that he was killed was not a homicide. It was an argument over a $50 debt that his friend Bud Moses Stilts owed him. But it was actually a fight over a much bigger deals. It was basically like, you know, you owe me $50 for that meth that I sold you. And it's like, I'm not, I'm the ruler of this territory now, bitch. I, I just was thinking out loud, like, I wonder if Carl Switzer is like one of the first earliest examples of what we now know as, you know, a real psychology for um, child stars, you know, children who were thrust into Hollywood um, at a young age and forced to work and mm-hmm. um, and provide for their families, you know, as small children, you know, often grow up to become drug addicts and dependent on, you know, drugs and alcohol. And I'm just thinking like, huh, I wonder if Carl Switzer is like one of the earliest of these sort of examples of kids, you know, they all, they all ended up like this. Almost all of them, like Spanky's the only one that actually had like a happy ending. Most of them died very young. Um, Ugh, uh, yeah, so sad, you know, or they, you know, they died in accidents. Like none of them want to have good, happy lives. But the thing about it right. is, and there's tons of websites dedicated to the mysterious reasons on why Carl Switzer was shot. Mm-hmm. And uh, evidently the, the evidence Behind it was a huge cover up in Hollywood in 1959. And uh, there are people there are websites that are run by people who uh, say claim to be clairvoyants and communicate with the dead spirit of Carl Switzer. They say, mm. I'm in the mood for love <laughs> simply because you're near me. And, you know, if you're going to be communicating with a dead celebrity, Carl Switzer's a good one because he's a tormented soul. So he would train dogs for rich people and take them out hunting. And one, um, his friend, Bud Stiltz was a welder that was living in the home of Ray Crash Corrigan. He was a famous Western movie star at the time. And so, uh, he had, I guess they had lost a dog that he had trained and alfalfa to be nice. He put up a one ad, um, saying if he would return the dog, he'd pay him a $50, which at the time was a lot of money. Uh, Somebody found the dog and the guy, Bud, the welder, refused to pay him the money. That was the story. But it turned Mm -hmm. out that other people are saying that it was $50 that was owed to him because he had sold him drugs. Mm. And this guy was a welder. He was. uh, So anyways, they made his death look like a homicide because they they planted a knife 
that Alfalfa didn't have. You mean they made it look like self-defense. And made it look like it's self-defense. In 2001, uh, 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 Tom Corrigan, who at the time was a 14-year-old boy, he witnessed the altercation. And he said that it was definitely a murder, um, but that the Hollywood film studios were covering it up because they didn't want to tarnish the brand of our gang uh, and, and making their, their big star Alfalfa grow up to be a drug dealer and a junkie mm. and all this other stuff. Poor Alfalfa died at the age of 31. Yeah, my God. He was a baby still. I know. Peaches, in your understanding of film history and Hollywood properties, is it common for studios to sort of like make people disappear or go away <laughs> because they feel like it's messing with the brand of the, of the franchise? Or is that uncommon? I think that that kind of stuff, at least there's been documentation in her early Hollywood and the studio system. I think... There was a bit of mob mentality to stuff where at least it's rumored that that sort of thing may have occurred. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know for sure. But I think I think back then, I mean, I'm reading this book about early San Francisco around the same time. And a lot of it is about the Hollywood um, elite coming up here to, to party. And they were all involved with the mafia and, and the government was involved with the mafia. So I don't see why it would be. Um, it, too far-fetched to think that the studio system would be as well. Did, did a lot of the people in Hollywood who moved to California in the mid, it's kind of in the mid thirties, they came from Chicago where the mob was big oh, here. Oh yeah. So they definitely like the people who started all these film studios who came from Chicago to California definitely had a mob mentality. Mm -hmm. And right. at that time, in, in especially in, in the fifties in LA, there was a lot of corruption mm -hmm. with the police department. Yeah. And nowadays they make movies about this right. corruption. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. And Chicago, you know, police was pretty much ruled by the Irish. And so any ethnic minority was kind of like living under the thumb of the Irish. And so you, you see a lot of the Italians move to the suburbs of Chicago uh, to, to, to kind of escape them i'm sure like a lot of the mob just kind of like hey let's go out to la where it's nice and sunny too and we don't have to deal with these chicago cops and you don't have to door. deal with the with a with a it was basically like a new town that they yeah. could own and it's the same reason las vegas was started it was mm -hmm. it was like these these sort of mob entertainment companies keep moving and settling new towns so they could sort of like run, run the game as they wanted to mm -hmm. i mean i don't know of any specific actors that were rubbed out but it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me now one actor uh roman navarro he was a silent film actor and you might recognize him from uh you know such movies as ben Hur. i think that was like his pretty his big hit and you'll see like illustrations uh, of him in it or you know photography of him in it because uh, it was like he was very scantily clad through much of it so he was very much a sex symbol now he was uh, he was born in mexico and he came to california and he became like out of, he was a bit player and then rudolph valentino died and uh he was kind of like the world viewed him as his replacement because he wasn't like a douglas fairbanks jr that had like that anglo-saxon good looks he was like you know a latin guy he was exotic he was exotic to them and you know rudolph valentino like when he died the world pretty much fucking fell apart like girls were just like fainting in the streets because people were so in love with him and so he kind of like came in and sucked up that vacuum and but Valentino wasn't murdered. It was it was no, his he, replacement. He, 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 yeah, it was his. Re well, his like, yeah, his replacement in the world. Valentino died here. I guess he had like ulcers and then he got like a bacterial infection and then he just he died uh, in a hospital. And I guess he didn't know he was dying because back then in the day, doctors didn't tell you you were going to die. <laughs> so he was like he woke up for a little bit, talked to the doctors about his career. And oh, I'm, when I get back to Hollywood, this and they're like, yeah. Uh huh. Okay, and then he died. Um, wow. And the weird thing about one thing about Valentino though too is because uh, there was, I guess, in men's bathrooms they would start selling like this this paper that had uh, powder on it because he was so powdered in all his films that it became kind of like a look, and so people were kind of like fighting against that because they thought it was like the feminization of American men, and so there was a lot of. Um, anger towards him from guys, but so, women loved him. So it was these pa this paper powder that they yeah. used to reduce shine on yeah, their faces. Yeah, exactly, and so it would leave some powder behind. So anyway, so Ro Roman Navarro, he grew up, uh, he, so he did silent films. He actually worked with Joan Crawford. He did uh, the film Across to Singapore. I watched a little bit of it on, uh, on YouTube, and, and Joan looks uh, very young and very cute. It's so weird because, you know, we think of Joan Crawford as Mommy Dearest, but also like Mildred Pierce and all those other things, but she made a lot of silent films. As a young woman. As a young 
young woman, you know, and I think even in one of them, she uh, danced naked in it because but before the Hays Code, you could do things like that. So Navarro, he, he went on to do other films and he went on to uh, make uh, uh, it was on like TV shows like High Chaparral. And then in October of, of uh, 1968, he invited two brothers over, Paul and Tom Ferguson. He hired them from an agency to have sex with them. And so they came over to his house, and I guess they had been drinking. Uh, Navarro was drunk. Uh, the one brother was on the phone with his girlfriend, and the other brother just he had just hauled off and like punched him a couple of times and and killed him. Now, when the when his death came out in the newspaper, uh, rumors were going around that he was actually he suffocated to death, like they shoved a Art Deco lead dildo that Rudolph Valentino had given to him like 45 years earlier. But I guess that's just a rumor. Was Valentino bisexual too? Uh, yeah, he was bisexual. Uh, Navarro was gay. Like, uh, So like how much tell. of a rumor was that? Like, was there even a real Art Deco led <laughs> dildo found at the scene? Or is that made up? You know, I don't know. I have to get uh, Daphne on the case and Scooby-Doo on the case of what happened to this lead dildo. Is it? It's like the, the, the original, we're finding all these original trends, right? Mm-hmm. It's the original Richard Gere gerbil story, <laughs> you know? Well, and I wonder if these uh, stories are planted sort of to discredit the actor after their death. Uh, well, it's homophobia, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. it's just sort of, you know. Because mm-hmm. we were thinking about doing a show about all the times celebrities have been accused of doing outrageous things like Rod Stewart. They had They're a pump. the cum of Chalice. Yeah, a Chalice thing. filled with cum. Richard I thought, Gere I with, that, that show. with a squirrel up his butt. Gerbil. Gerbil. Mm-hmm. And I think Ozzy Osbourne did, in fact. Bite the head off a bat. Yeah, he was just high and he thought it was a prop bat mm. and so he bit the yeah that that actually happened yeah it's the one the ones that are really homophobic in nature mm-hmm. like when i was a kid i definitely heard that rod stewart had to have a stomach pump mm-hmm. because yeah you know he had uh he drank swallowed a, chalice, so much a goblet full of cum but that wasn't the story i heard it, w- it was just more that he'd sucked so many dicks that there was so much cum inside of him he had oh, to no, have a, he, he, he he can't they all came into like a, a, a goblet and he drank it <laughs> oh really that's the story oh, that's... i heard the outrageous thing about it is if you th- really think about it mm-hmm. if you drank a goblet full of cum nothing bad really would happen except it's like eating, drinking a lot of eggs mm. now he actually says he knows exactly who started that rumor and it was uh he uh, somebody that worked with him and i guess uh, they took some kind of trip to hawaii and that guy actually had to share a room with Rod Stewart's kid and I think he brought a trick home or something like that and it was like he got fired from that and so he started that rumor I think that's oh my god went. yeah he addressed it and so these brothers you know uh, they, they did get arrested for the murder uh, and they spent actually very little time in jail uh, and they uh, went on to actually commit other crimes and one of the kids actually uh, eventually committed suicide in 2005 and then well, uh, Carl Switzer's murder Alfalfa's murderer he spent uh, the rest of he lived until 1983 and he spent most of his life like beating up women and mm-hmm. doing all sorts of illegal activity mm-hmm. and so uh, you can definitely see that it's probably why homophobia is involved in this case uh, now yeah. now in a 2012 interview uh, Paul Ferguson who's the guy who actually hit him he said as far as Mr. Navarro I came to peace with that a long time ago I'm at peace with what happened it was not intentional it was an accident I'm not at peace that a human being is dead, and I was part of that, that has haunted me. I never deliberately hurt Mr. Navarro. I'm absolutely responsible, but it's not the things that you do. It's the things you do intentionally. It's who you are. You have a lot of shitty written on your brow in, with your regards, and I don't know what role it played in my brother Tommy's suicide either. I have to wonder about that. You know, okay, I'm, I'm more curious about... Well, obviously the lead dildo, but we'll never know. (laughs) And then the other thing I'm curious about is this sort of idea that, like, I don't know, 19 whatever. What what, what year did they do this? Like 68. 1968. Yeah. That there was some sort of version of Rent Boy back then. You know, like, what what agency? I mean, I didn't realize that. Did you know that? Oh, yeah, there was some, what's that? I want to say it's Scott Brewer or something like that. And he talks about uh, he wrote a tell all book uh, on Hollywood and how he would uh, he was started out as an escort himself and that he would uh, I want to say it all went down at the car wash. Right. 
There was some kind of the car, old car wash. Something happened. At what? The, yeah, there was something about like uh, people would go to get their car washed and get serviced, or they'd hire boys out of the car wash. It was that. It was like so, that. Kind so it of was thing. like a gay sex parlor slash car something wash. Something along those. And lines. because mostly men drove cars yeah. and mostly men owned cars, it was a good cover for that. It was probably a, a good cover for something. Yeah, and he would talk about like all the all the people that would uh, hire escorts, all the producers, directors, you know, Rock Hudson, all of them, because it's like you know. Uh, you want sex and you want sex with hot yeah. guys. Some, you know, you got to pay for it sometimes. Makes sense. You know, so, yeah. And so uh, that was uh, 1968. So I'm sure by then they probably just had, you know, they probably had ads in the back of little magazines and whatnot. And these brothers, they, they weren't openly gay later. They were they were straight guys. Yeah. Well, they went on the to agency. like uh, they, they went on to uh, sexually assault a woman together. I think that's when they went to prison uh, oh. another time. Uh, Real was, classy family. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, <laughs> there's something definitely going on there. And he did also talk in this interview, too, that it was it was kind of like an uh, uh, homophobia that, that drove him to it. it. He said it was just something about, you know, having this old gay guy and just it just it, it, it infuriated him and he went off and he punched him. And I guess uh, he's he kind of in some ways blames the victim. He's like, well, if he wasn't so drunk, he probably would have lived. But because he was drunk, his blood was thin and he bled, you know, he bled out and suffocated or something. Mm. I'm really haunted by the death of Sal Minio from. Rebel Without a Cause. Yeah, I love, love, love Salminio. He was the star of a movie that, if your listeners haven't seen it and they want to see a really sexy, old exploitation film, I highly recommend Who Killed Teddy Bear, where Salminio um, has a scene in a Speedo that became, at the time, so iconic for gay men that they would buy tickets to see this movie over and over again just to see this dripping wet Salminio get out of a pool in his Speedo. Mm. It is fabulous. Now, what's amazing about Sal is that he actually kind of lived a pretty openly gay life, as opposed to like most of the other people that were very closeted. Well, he even played a bisexual burglar himself. <laughs> and your P.S., your cat is dead. Aww. It was a it was a stage play. And he actually uh, seemed like he was turning his career around at the time. And then he was stabbed to death in an alley behind his apartment building. Again, there was like a cover up behind that. What, whether he was actually killed by the pizza delivery man or these guys were there to have sex with him. Why did they stab him once? But it was reported that he was stabbed multiple times. And again, there's uh, websites dedicated to, to uh, psychics who communicate with the tortured soul of Sal Minio. What really did happen, you think, you guys? I don't know, but they did convict somebody like years later, Lionel Ray Williams. They convicted him of the murder. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure how they were able to convict him from that. Uh, he's an African-American guy, so you might think he's just like, hey, you're good for this crime. Throw him in jail. Uh, right. It's, so uh, who, you know, knows? who who really who who knows? Yeah. But I also think it's very interesting that uh, all the leads in Rebel Without a Cause really just died tragically. James Dean died in a car accident. Natalie Woods drowned. Some people, and we didn't include this in the uh, actresses who were murdered, some people say that she was murdered on that boat. That and she was you know, yeah, say she was thrown off the boat. And you know, uh, she was probably thrown off by her the heart guy, um, heart to heart. Oh, it could have been the other guy who was on uh, Christopher, Christopher Walken. Walken. Christopher Walken. She walked in on them having gay sex, and then she's they they were like, okay, Natalie's got to go. Let's see if wood floats. Oh, right, that's right. They didn't throw her off the boat. I guess the idea is they killed her on the boat. Oh, is that it? Ooh, yeah. but again, all yeah, but, rumors. You know, who Rebel knows? Without a Cause is kind of the 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 original Poltergeist. Because Poltergeist was also one of those movies that they thought was cursed, you know? Oh, yeah. Because the so, cast and crew started dying. Mm-hmm. And I, will, I have one um, anecdotal story about Salminio that I think is really sweet, which is back in uh, 1998, um, I screened Who Killed Teddy Bear at uh, Midnight Mass. And what we did was uh, to promote the whole season, we did these big sort of blown up um, caricatures on, on foam core um, with, a, with a, an oversized printer. And we had, you know, Joan Crawford and Tura Satana in the lobby, but we had one of dripping wet Salminio in his Speedo. And there was this old man who came not to Midnight Mass, but he came to see another movie, but he just kept staring at the, the Salminio. And I was like, oh my God, look at that perv, you know? And um, 
And then he came over to me and said, um, you know, what, what are you doing with this? Uh, when, when you're done with it. And I <laughs> was like, a hole. Oh my God, girl, <laughs> calm down. And, uh, and I said, Oh, you know, I don't know. We'll probably put it in storage or something. He said, well, well, could I have it or could I buy it from you? I was a, uh, lover of Salminio and I've never gotten over it. And, mm. uh, I said, sure, you can have it, you know? And so, you know, I didn't know if his story was true or not or whatever. So, he comes to pick it up like a few months later when we were done our, our series and brings with him to share with me letters, love letters that Sal had written him over the years. And we sat together over a coffee and he let me read these amazing letters that Sal had written him. And it was just very touching. And, you know, um, they were, you know, what they weren't just lovers. They had real feelings for each other. Um, so, you know, I, I, I thought that was a nice Aww. story. And also too, it made me love Sal Minio even more. Cause you know, you really, especially back then there was no email, you know, phone calls were less, um, available. So people actually wrote letters and put all their feelings, you know, took pen mm -hmm. to paper and Sal Minio, I mean, they, these were real love letters that he had written this guy over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, probably like, uh, two, how many, when was the revolutionary war in 1776 yeah. like uh the new musical hamilton is getting criticized because it erases alexander hamilton's uh love letters to lawrence even both of them even though both of them are main characters in the musical mm -hmm. there's no game mm -hmm. and so we'll see that in, in the future mm -hmm. uh sal Minio's, uh l homosexuality be erased in a musical in broadway <laughs> <laughs> i doubt it because he was so open about it yeah, I would think he's one of those people where it's not really a question. I mm -hmm. think it'd be really hard to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned poltergeist and kind of like the curse of poltergeist. The little girl and it died uh, tragically from a disease. Uh, Dominique Dunn was murdered and we actually covered her and the actresses who were murdered. And then one of the other actors and he was also murdered. Lou Perryman. Mm -hmm. He was also in uh, Boys Don't Cry. Uh, he was in the original film crew for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And he was in the movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And he played like one of the scientists that came to like check the house for supernatural activity. There was two dudes in that in the in the redheaded woman. And he played one of those. And he, he was, was the white guy. He was the white guy. Yeah. Oh, really? I thought he was uh, maybe someone who was helping to install the pool. I thought he was a construction worker. Maybe he was. Oh, okay. So he's <laughs> not the guy who thought he was eating like maggots. Oh, remember? No, that scene? Yeah, no, yeah. no. It's he had him. a really, he had a really, really small part mm -hmm. in um, Poltergeist. And the reason my nerdy self mm -hmm. is is so I love Poltergeist, mm -hmm. but because this guy. And in the genre world, when someone shows up in one, more than one iconic movie, even in a smaller part, um, because this guy had a bigger part in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, a much more memorable part, it was fun to go back and figure out that he was this bit part in Poltergeist where mm -hmm. he drinks Joe Beth Williams' coffee kind of behind her back. He's only in the movie for like a moment. Ah. Um, but, but if you're obsessed with the movie, like a lot of us were – you you remember his little moment, mm -hmm. um, and um, and yeah, he was he was helping to install the pool. He was one of the construction workers um, that Dominic Dunn actually flips off, you know, um, mm. before going to school, and uh, and he had this bigger part in Texas Chainsaw Massacre too. And in the genre world, because he was in both of those films. He's actually, if you're a hardcore horror fan, you know, he's a notable, Lou Perryman is a lo notable, you know, person. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he was a uh, murder. He, he was also in the movie Boys Don't Cry, which is, you know, the, the life of Brandon Tina that um, Hillary Swank that, won an Oscar for I that, did right? not know until you sent me your notes for mm -hmm. the show, which yeah. I didn't even realize that. And so he was murdered. Uh, this guy gets out of prison. He'd gone off his medications and he'd been drinking and he uh, uh, killed him in his home and he killed him with an axe. Yeah, so, yeah. Horrible. I know. So he was the guy was sentenced to life in prison. But imagine, you know, being in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and then being killed by an axe. You know, what kind of like you're like, weird. so this is what it feels like. You know, I mean, at, at a certain point in your death, you're going, hmm. So now art imitates li life, imitates art. Mm. 
And so uh, uh, next on the list is uh, Tupac. And Tupac, we're all kind of like, we're still confused about exactly, is he dead? How did he die? And who killed him? He's the I most believe it's pronounced young. Tupac. 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 Yes. I think That's Obama I pronounces think that, it Tupac, though. Tupac, you're right. Tupac. <laughs> that must be my Midwestern accent coming out. But if you ask a lot of black people like about conspiracies, and <clears throat> the number one is who killed Biggie, Smalls, and Tupac. Mm-hmm. And then the second one is uh, the O.J. Simpson, which I actually, I guess it's been revealed that O.J. Simpson did commit the crime, but he's not the one who actually killed uh, Nicole Brown Simpson. Well, from the it TV was, show, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, it was his son, uh, the chef, who was bipolar and and uh, off his medications. Who Nicole mm-hmm. Brown Simpson pissed off, mm-hmm. and he he went lit to her home later mm-hmm. that night, killed her, and then his dad, O.J. Simpson, helped cover up the crime. Now, and well, that's why the gloves mm-hmm. didn't fit. Uh, and that's why he got the quit. Now, yeah. the, uh, the what's interesting in doing research for this show, there was another waiter at that restaurant. That uh, Nicole Simpson Brown's friend uh, worked at the yeah. one that I guess they ate there that night, or they didn't eat at that one, but they ate at another one. He also was murdered, like within a month of those other people being murdered. Whoa. And so some people say that that was another connection, maybe connected to that crime. Now he was an actor, but I couldn't find any movie roles for him, so I didn't include him in it. Don't give that restaurant a bad right. Yelp review. <laughs> Right. I don't think that restaurant's still around. <laughs> yeah, it's you know. like you know, be careful when you write those Yelp reviews. They're gonna come. It's like ABC. So, so uh, Tupac. Uh, what what uh, what's actually like? Do we know and not know about his death? I don't think we know anything. I mean, because he was shot once before and survived, yeah. right? And then he was shot again, and then he died. But there's so much uh, stuff around that murder that it's kind of like, who knows? And we don't know who killed him. I think we had Brian Sweeney on the podcast before, and Brian had some theories about that, what was happening with it. And, you know, he did do film, and he actually, people say that he uh, was, a, was a very good actor, and that uh, he was, it was a loss to, to the uh, cinema world that he died so young. Well, I, I guess I, I've only seen him in uh, Poetic Justice that I can mm-hmm. remember, but I do remember him being, like, yeah, very good actor, as we know, mm-hmm. not all um, uh, pop music or, you know, rap music uh, performers can t- cross over and be good actors or mm-hmm. actresses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Mariah Carey. <laughs> and why, why are uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people, uh, they're saying that uh, that uh, Tupac is alive still, had his, his death faked, and is now living in Cuba, probably. <laughs> I just don't know how in this day and age you could fake your own death, you know? It's just, it was just, before the internet, so maybe, I don't know. But with DNA and all those other kinds of things, it's just like... Has how, it how ever been proven it? that any celebrity has done that? Has that ever been proven? No, I mean, I no. have a friend who thinks that her father may have um, may have uh, faked his own death because her, her father was a con artist and uh, he died in a house fire like the whole house was burnt down. And so uh-huh. she thinks that maybe her father might be living somewhere. So she, but she doesn't really know. So so um, looking at, about Tupac is that uh, he was cremated, cremated and the man who cremated him re- mysteriously retired after doing so. And that since his death. Seven albums have all been released under his name with his voice. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were like, people are saying there's no way that he was able to record all those albums before he died. And he's just put out tons and tons of music. Michael Jackson, Prince, they all have a ton of music that has never been released and, you know, may never be released or it might be released many years. I mean, and the three films were released after his death, Bullet, Gridlocked and Gang Related. So, you know, all things are possible. And that a lot of uh, people who believe in that, that Tupac is actually uh, hiding in Cuba uh, are hopeful that he might come forward um, now that uh, diplomatic relations between Cuba have been restored. <laughs> we'll see. Now, I think probably one of the saddest ones and probably the ones that affected like, uh, you know, a lot of people was the, the murder of Phil Hartman at the hands of his wife, who was struggling with substance abuse and was also uh, taking Zoloft. And uh, I guess they got into some kind of fight. And he said, I'm going to leave you if you don't get help. And then he went to bed and she ended up shooting him. 
And uh, then uh, she called some friends, and then they called the police. Uh, but before uh, they could get there, she actually committed suicide. And her family went on to sue Zoloft uh, because I guess it guess makes people have suicidal tendencies. They settled for some uh, uh, undisclosed sum. Uh, I'm not really sure how that was uh what was negotiated uh who knows but it was just like it's such a loss and it's like when i hear him on like his voice on the simpsons today watching the reruns it still kind of breaks my heart a little bit uh, that was one of the most shocking horrible saddest mm. murders i mean ugh, yeah i mean the, uh, they sued for uh, zoloft creating suicidal tendencies but i wonder too like how much i mean the, the case you know revolved around the fact that Mur- murder tendencies is is a little different than suicidal mm. tendencies. You know, like she did both. Mm-hmm. Now, allegedly, there's a huge uh, tiff or fight between Andy Dick, um, John Lovitz, and Phil Hartman that led to his wife getting her brain kind of scrambled. And um, John Lovitz blames Andy Dick for reintroducing Phil Hartman's wife to cocaine. And, uh, and, and of course, Andy Dick is kind of like psycho. Um, he says that, uh, he approached him one time in a restaurant and says, I put the Phil Hartman hex on you. You are the next one to die. What? So Andy Andy Dick Dick may have been, Andy Dick may have been responsible for messing with his wife well, that led to his uh, murder. The thing is, is like when you're rich and you have access to money and you live in Hollywood, you're going to find cocaine. You know, it's not it's not yeah. going to be that hard. But so that's why a, Andy Dick doesn't get a lot of work in Hollywood is because of, of Phil. Well, Hollywood. he's also a dick. <laughs> and he's he's also, dick. Yeah. I think he's also an addict in his mm-hmm. own right. Yeah. And wasn't he what did he get banned from? Didn't we reported on him a couple of times? He gets banned all the time from things, you know, for for being pushy and Mm -hmm. loud. Hmm, I wonder what other people in our lives behaves that way (laughs) because of cocaine. Uh, I wonder. Well, but the the thing about it is that, you know, let let other people. I mean, Mm -hmm. the reason we're telling all these stories is like and hopefully that will inspire people to sort of not get murdered, not get murdered. But, you know, uh, focus on the work. She hung up on you. No, she's Me? still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. <laughs> we're, getting, <laughs> we're getting a telemarketer come, calling in. I was like, I thought it disabled this. Uh, I guess you did. Oh. Let me just push that there. There we go. I wonder what people in our lives would benefit from learning about Andy Dick's demise. <laughs> well, Andy Dick is still around. It's the people around him that are not. I haven't heard anything about him for a while. I mean, he used to show up at drag events and stuff in L.A., but... I he he really was a dad. Heard. He has he has two kids. He's a huh. dad. Really? Yeah. Well, he's bisexual, isn't he? That's right. Wow. There you go. Peaches, what's what's up on your plate? You're going to uh, the UK soon, huh? Yes. Uh, before that, though, um, this this coming Friday and Saturday in San Francisco, um, Peaches Christ Productions is presenting uh, Latrice Royale's one woman show. Here's to life. Oh. Uh, the San Francisco premiere of that. Um, so it's Latrice um, and a three-piece jazz band doing a night, an intimate concert of um, storytelling and song. Uh, we're really excited to be doing that. And then right after that, I jump on a plane and I go to Norway. And um, I'll be in Norway for a week. Um, I'm on the jury of the Oslo um, International um, gay and lesbian film festival. Uh, so I'm very flattered and honored to be going to Norway. I will be appearing there one night. I'm doing a peaches show. So if you have any Norwegian listeners, um, they can check out the film festival website for details. Uh, and then after that, I come back to the States and I go to Washington DC and I'll be uh, celebrating um, the Rocky Horror Picture Show at the American Film Institute oh, wow. in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, on uh, September 24th, and uh, and then from there I head directly to Seattle with Mink Stoll. Mink and I will meet up in Maryland, and we'll fly from Baltimore to Seattle, and then we'll start our Gray Gardens tour, and we'll do Gray Gardens in Seattle on uh, September 29th with Jinx Monsoon. And then we'll bring it to San Francisco on October 8th with Jinx Monsoon and Mink Stoll. And then Jinx and I 
we'll head to the UK and we'll do Grey Gardens in London and Manchester where wow. the shows are already sold out. So I don't feel the need to promote as much uh, the UK shows because Manchester sold out and then London, two shows sold out in less than 24 hours. Wow, that's amazing. Mink, Mink Stoll's playing who? Mink Stoll plays herself. In great Return to Grey Gardens? Yes. So you rewrote the, the, the script, or did you write a part of it? No, no, no. Mink Stoll was in the original show with us. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she was in the original San Francisco show. And so Mink Stoll um, plays herself. And when she's been able to do it, like in the New York City production, um, we've had her uh, be part of the show. But she hasn't been able to do all of the shows because Jinx and I, you know, I've done it so much. <laughs> Mink can't kind of like uh, do it with us every time we do it. But, mm. um, it, you know, so so some people have seen it where the Mink stole um, part. Basically what it is is Mink, someone plays themselves and comes to try to talk Peaches Christ out of continuing uh, doing the show. Um, it's at a big birthday party scene where Peaches – um, is celebrating her 80th birthday and uh, Mink shows up and tries to talk me out of doing the show. And it's the, it's the birthday scene from the movie. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, it, and, so it can be played when by Mink hasn't been available. People. One show, it was Binda La Creme who played the part and uh, in, in Manchester in London, it'll be Cheddar Gorgeous um, in, in Los Angeles. It was squeaky blonde. So it, you know, it, it does change. The script changes in every um, city we go to. So even for this new tour, I had to write a Seattle script, a San Francisco script, a London script, and a Manchester script because mm. the show is site specific. Mm. And so the premise of, of your version of Grey Gardens is that it's two drag queens who are sort of stuck in a dysfunctional relationship and they're doing a show in a d d dilapidated theater that's been overtaken by raccoons, right? Yeah, the show, when you arrive to see the show, uh, it's all normal. And then as the lights go down, you're catapulted 40 years into the future. And it's as if you're, you know, in you're a ghost in an empty auditorium watching these two people perform for nobody. Um, and they've been doing the same show for 40 years. Oh, that's so mm. brilliant. And, and uh, thank hope, you. Does thank it have a you. happy ending? <laughs> <laughs> Does it they have a happy ending? I would say it has a touching ending that people don't expect from a drag show. Wow. The I great thing I about our Great it. Garden show is that people laugh and laugh and laugh, and then some people even tear up at the end, um, which for me was a first. I'd never written a show that actually made people feel <laughs> emotional or sentimental. And I Aww. think to some degree it's why – this particular show of ours has had such long legs. Mm. Do you feel like sometimes that you're sort of in a, you know, stuck in, in, in the, uh, that, do you ever dream that you were doing something else or, uh, you know, that you feel like you're sort of like one of those characters in gray gardens, uh, in a, in a delusional world of your own making that you can't escape. No, <laughs> I don't. I, I, I would say it's actually the opposite that, that in my later 20s, and now I'm 42, in my late 20s, I did go through this pro period of feeling a lot of shame around being a drag performer. And uh, and I think I came to grips with that and uh, made some lifestyle changes and and uh, and did stuff uh, in, in order to commit to um, this performance career and the idea of wanting to um, do drag theater and make movies and write and do, you know, improv theater, sketch comedy. And and uh, and now at the age of 42 and for the past, I, I would say, five to 10 years, uh, I feel completely blessed. And every night I went to the theater this this past month you know, for all these shows of showgirls and I would put on the makeup and my face would hurt and my body would hurt from, from wearing a, a corset and my legs would hurt from wearing heels. I felt nothing but gratitude that I get to do this. And, uh, 
I, I, I really, truly, I really feel that way. Like I have one of the weirdest careers I think of anyone. Um, and I, and I'm, I feel really lucky and blessed and I'm so grateful. And every time an audience buys tickets to see our shows, I, I want to um, go out and shake all of their hands and thank them because they allow me to live this dream. It's a beautiful dream. May you never wake from it. <laughs> yeah, I, I really feel that way. I really, really do. And maybe you're getting me on a, a on an emotional, tired Monday where I, you know, am exhausted. But I don't feel anything but um, grateful. I mean, there are challenges with this career, as I'm sure you know. Um, sometimes it's hard to be away from uh, my partner. Niha, you know, I get to travel a lot, but there there are downsides to it. But the upside is uh, I get to work with my friends and make people laugh. And doing showgirls for the past month and having people say to us, I've never laughed so hard, you know, for two hours. My jaw hurt from laughing. I feel like right now with everything that's going on in the world, mm. um, people need this now more than ever. And uh, we, for two hours, we, we let them um, enter the stardust 1995 and forget about fucking Trump and anything else, you know, that we're bombarded with every day on social media and in the news. Um, and for two hours, they got to just sort of laugh and, and live in the world of showgirls. And what a gift that this is what my job is. This is my job. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a great job it's a great job and you do it very yeah. very well well peaches thanks for uh letting us escape the torments and horrors of our existence by <laughs> visiting somebody else's tour <laughs> by, by talking about torments. yeah murder <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys i love you guys and it was good to um catch up and do a show together and I hope I get to see you soon. Yeah, come to Chicago. You're working on something, right? I hear. We are. We are. There's definitely something in the works. Like, I guarantee you, if not for one, um, uh, there'll be two, but at least one is coming together right now. Chicago um, 2017 uh, event. So really? that is happening. 2017? 2017 for sure, yeah. Okay. Early or late 17? Uh, spring, okay. but I can't tell you what it is yet. I uh, have, a, I have an idea. Maybe. Well, if you have an extra I day, maybe I, come, maybe come. I did tell you. <laughs> yeah, I think you did. Yeah. If you have an extra so. day, come cook with us. Oh, yeah, for sure. For we'll sure. make some crab cakes. <laughs> oh, yeah, we should do um, a cooking show. <sighs> it would be scrumptious. Mm. <laughs> Let's do soft shell crabs. Yummies. Faust is like, I'm like, that's expensive. <laughs> we'll use imitation crab. Yeah, I'd be like, uh, we'll pretend Ew, it's no, real. No, no, no. I'll, I'll buy, I'll pay for the crab. I'll even pay to have it freeze dry shipped from Maryland, Ooh. which I have done in the past. It what? is expensive, but oh my yeah, God. you can have crab, crab shipped from Maryland. Oh, sure. Now, do you actually know how to make it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would use my mother's recipe okay. and we could do. Crab cakes. I mean, I'm I'm obviously a snob when it comes to crab cakes. So I've that's um, why I figure because you're from Maryland and the, it's all of you know it's all about crabs. There. I thought you were yeah. just joking. <laughs> that sounds no, no, delicious. No. I, I'm a big fan. I think of crab that's what cakes. we should do. And we yeah. make we'll make a nice uh, three bean salad. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> some corn on the cob. Some yeah. boiled potatoes. Well, we'll see what. Yeah, the, all of that sounds delicious. A very yummy. like Cape Cod kind of. Uh, Just uh, Maryland. Oh, Maryland. Yeah, Maryland, getting your places girl. confused. Maryland. Oh, Maryland. I, I have never been to these places. So <laughs> <laughs> You've never been to Maryland. I've never been to Ma Maryland. I've never been to Provincetown. I've never been to Cape Cod. You got to get out more. Yeah, I yeah. Would, I, thought the money. <laughs> yeah, I would. I'd you be there right now. You need to do an East Coast, East Coast tour. We should. We'll do I, it. I, it's not up to me, man. <laughs> I would be there right now doing it if I could. <sighs> peaches, uh, I'm looking for it. I'm going to hold it to it's hold you to it. It's it's uh, Crab Cakes with Peaches Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a funny thing to say. <laughs> crabs. Crabs. With peaches. We got a case peaches of the crabs. Peaches gave me crabs. <laughs> <laughs> a big case from, from well they, they'll come live right we, so we well no um what no we would, i would order the 
it, it, it would be picked already. It would be picked uh, cra- blue crab, Maryland crab meat mm-hmm. that we would ship. Uh, we okay. wouldn't send them a lot. I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can send them live. Now, no? Peaches, I, I, I hear that when you have a live crab and you put it in boiling water, it's screaming for its life. Is yes, that true? that's true. Yes. And, and so you, as a person who likes to, you know, horror films on this stuff that kind of gets you excited a little. <laughs> no, I actually don't. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that, mm. but, uh, well, guess what? I, I, I researched that and, uh, it's, it's a myth. They don't really scream. It's air escaping their ex- exoskeleton. They, I would imagine they die very quickly. Yeah. They're not, they're not like going, help me peaches. Why did you do? Th-? No, it's, it's more like, <laughs> But for people people yeah. who've never been to it before, like I've brought friends home to Maryland, uh, and if you've never been to a Maryland crab feast, yeah, it's kind of like people are horrified because mm-hmm. they just – you put newspaper all over the table, and they just dump these bushels of crabs you know, in piles, and everyone sits around a table with their uh, beer or soda or whatever, and then you just rip into these crabs with hammers and knives and your fingers and – you know, eat the meat. And for people who haven't seen it or experienced it, I guess it's really disgusting. Oh, well, and we're, you'll have to do it in drag. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, why not? It'd be, yeah. Uh, thank you, Peaches. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day, you guys. Oh, we will. Thank you. It's gorgeous. All right, here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Peaches Christ lives in San Francisco, California. If you want to check out more about Peaches Christ's shows and adventures in the world of drag, go to peacheschrist.com. Oh, I'm so disappointed I didn't get to see her doing the Showgirls musical. I mean, she's done a tribute for, what is it, ni- this is their 19th one, but nothing like a, 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 this level, because it's like th- a three-week run. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, and it's a full two-hour musical. Well, they've been workshopping this musical in some way or another for quite some yeah. time, mm-hmm. and I wanted to see it. And they they were like, "Oh yeah, well, uh, we'll invite you when when it, when Is it, it the comes." Same musical that came. I, it might be. I don't um, know if it was. Uh, there was somebody doing a musical here in town in Chicago, and we were like, "We want to see it. We want to see it. We want to talk about it." Blah, blah, blah. And they purposefully like didn't tell us about it because they didn't want us to see it because they were worried that we wouldn't like it. <laughs> It's showgirls. How could you not like it? And it's like, even when it's bad, it's good. It's like pizza. Mm-hmm. You know, it's still pizza. It's like sex. It's still a blowjob. <laughs> Must be weird having them not come all over your face like that anymore. <laughs> hey, guys, guess what? This week on Cooking with Drag Queens, it's uh, Nicole Page Brooks Woo-woo. making some slab pie. NPB. F-A-G-S-L-A-B. Nicole Page Brooks from Atlanta, Georgia. And so we're making a blueberry pie, cheesecake, Mm -hmm. vanilla cookie, slab pie. So it's Mm -hmm. three different desserts combined into a delicious masterpiece that is easy to make and can impress your friends at your local Mm -hmm. bake sale at church. (laughs) Ah, Nicole Page Brooks. She's a very interesting drag queen. She's a... Considers herself more of a female impersonator than a drag queen, even though she's a drag queen. Uh, but she, she occupies really, a drag space. She, uh, occupies a drag space, but she really feels as though she, you know, passes. And in many ways, she does. She's kind of has. It's as though Julia Roberts and Beavis and Butthead all had a baby together. <laughs> you know, and that's. Are you saying because of her tempo and pacing? Her tempo and pacing, and her looks is kind of like you it's know. Like, I'm a, I'm a woman. Like, <laughs> little, <laughs> I'm a woman now. And also, too, is like you know, let's just be honest. She's stoned out of her mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like we were doing one show and she was doing another show, and we were not occupying the same space time continuum. Yeah. And and the thing about it is like now watching it, mm-hmm. it's hysterically funny. Yeah. But the pacing is it's, very sublime. It's it's a it's a weird it's a weird little episode of Cooking with It's Dragon a really weird episode because sure. we're Mark and I are very high strung and we're trying to keep the pace up and she's like now wait a second here. <laughs> Where's my cocktail? <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I don't like cherry pies. Because we were supposed to make a cherry slab pie. Well, we were going to make a cherry pie with her because uh, uh, when she was eliminated from RuPaul's Drag Race, the, the contest that they had was she had to go out on the street and try and sell coupons for her cherry pie. She's like, buy my cherry pie, buy my cherry pie. Wait and till the, you get a taste, taste of my, my pie. pie. My pie. Yeah, M-A-H. P A H, and it turned out My she pie. just she just hates cherries. Yeah, she thinks they're disgusting. And so you'll uh, watch the video and you'll and you'll get to understand. Why. So that's coming on uh, our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash Feast of Fun. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully, maybe we'll see. Uh, uh, zip, 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 zip it. You can't talk about that oh, part of it. She's not going to be on. Nope. Maybe or maybe not. She oh. may be. Uh, uh, Nicole Page Rokes may or may not be uh, making a guest appearance on. Something you like to watch on mm-hmm. television. Oh, maybe or maybe not. Cupcake Wars. <laughs> hey, I want everybody to go visit our store at feastoffun.com slash store. This week we have a sale going on, 20% off of everything for our for Labor Day. We're doing a Labor Day sale, so that's 20% off of t-shirts, tote bags, mugs, all of it. And also we have a new line of leather products on there, leather goods. They're made by a fabulous company out in L.A. They are handmade. Handmade, handcrafted by Kiko Leathers. We met these guys here in Chicago. Uh, they're a new company. They've only been around for two years, and I really, really liked their products. And I said, you know what? Uh, can I sell some of these in the store? And they're just like, yeah, let's do it. And so you can go and get wallets, mouse pads, travel kits, backpacks, uh, tech gear, all made out of great looking leather. And these leather products, these wallets are really well made. They look great. They feel good in your pocket mm-hmm. and they hold on to your money really good. <laughs> and as long <laughs> as long as you know. And so the thing about this, too, is like I know people are like leather goods are like, oh, I'm going to go get a harness or fed. This isn't fetish wear. You not know, yet. This is, not yet. We may, maybe we'll get to that. Uh, I'm looking for a uh, provider for that kind of stuff. But go go check it out at feastofun.com slash store. And if you click on the tab for uh, leather goods, it'll be right there. And remember, folks, uh, Feast of Fun is made possible because of your financial support. Do you like listening to the podcast? Please consider becoming a premium subscriber and access our entire catalog of shows. All the shows with Peaches Christ that we've done over the past 12 years Mm -hmm. are available on our site, Mm feastoffun.com. And you can only access them by becoming a premium subscriber at feastoffun.com slash plus. Now, we would make them free for the public, but, uh, you know, that opens us up into hijinks from yeah. fraudsters. Well, well, this is the thing, though, too, is like, you know, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the work that we've done on the podcast over the past 12 years, but I'm not always proud of everything that's been said. So, you know, what was said eight years ago isn't necessarily who we are today. And I, I don't want anybody to listen to a show from eight years ago and get that impression that that's, that's how we are now. And so that's part of the reason also, too, why we've locked up content. Because nowadays, two people are kind of looking at what kind of imprint, what kind of trail you're leaving on the internet. And a lot of it, that's why like Snapchat has kind of become more important is that you kind of, in some ways you want your trail in some ways to disappear in some respects. And so I don't Unfortunately want, yeah. about that too, I think as LGBT people, we've had so much of our history erased. Yeah. I mean, you know, Hamilton, the musical is a great yeah. show, but it does. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, but what I'm hearing from some other people is that it does erase mm-hmm. Alexander Hamilton's mm-hmm. bisexuality. Right. And I think that it's really important for us, for future generations, to leave a record right. uh, of our voices, of our thoughts and ideas. And Feast of Fun is a way of archiving LGBT history. And it's there, but it's there for somebody who's committed to investigating. It's not there for the casual listener, the the person that's like doing a Google search on somebody and maybe out to do see, harm uh, on them. Like looking to see if they want to get hired for a job and like trying to see that. And so that's part of the reason why, you know, that we've locked the content for multiple reasons. And because uh, it costs a lot of money to mm-hmm. produce a show and, and uh, sometimes we lose money uh, making it. Available to the public. And so we need to cover our costs in order to continue in the future. And if we can't, um, a lot of these archives, uh, unfortunately, will probably be lost. So if you believe in LGBT history and these podcasts that we do and these interviews, uh, we urge you to consider becoming a premium s- subscriber at feastoffun.com slash plus. I hope I've made my case. I hope that you who are listening, who've been listening for all these years or just become a new listener, uh, would who's on the fence, who's thinking, what do I, what do I get out of this? You're helping to ensure that this podcast is around for years to come and is available to you 
for for the years to come. Mm-hmm. It's not something that you're going to be like, well, you know, I'm sure someone else will do it. I'm right. sure somebody else is going right. to help with this mm-hmm. show. But the the reality is that it that it is still a niche audience, and if, if some if you wait for somebody else to to step up to the plate, it's not going to happen. No. It's not. It won't be around. Mm-hmm. And and then you'll have to listen to static and white noise of the erasure of LGBT history. You'll have history. to listen to the millennial whoop. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's the eighties <laughs> whoop. That's the same thing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, later this week, we're uh, talking to an author who came out with a a, a fake biography, uh, an autobiography of Joan Crawford mm-hmm. called Mommy Smearist. Yes. And it's uh, her attempt to clear the record mm-hmm. it's from Jones, beyond the grave. Joan's unauthorized fake autobiography and pop culture parody for movie star heaven. And the subtitle is "Bitch, selfies do not make you a movie star." <laughs> I think that's we have a title for our show. Yeah, there. of course. So cool. look forward to that uh, on tomorrow's show. Yeah, thanks so much for listening, everyone. We thank you so much for your support, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Mm-hmm.